Good morning, everybody. Good morning. All right. Thank you for coming today. I appreciate it very much. Um, I know that we're we have we're joined by our friends at at C-SPAN, and many of you are watching uh, over the internet. And to all of you, whether you're here or whether you're virtual, I'm delighted to welcome you. My name is Arthur Brooks. I'm president of the American Enterprise Institute, and you are at an AEI event. I guess you knew that part on our series in philanthropic freedom, harnessing the power of markets to tackle global poverty with my friend Jacqueline Novogratz. Those of you who are here uh, because of Jacqueline know of the incredible accomplishments, the approach to poverty that she has taken, which has really changed the terms of the debate. Those of you who are not familiar with her work, I'm gonna give you one paragraph and then we're gonna get started on a conversation that's gonna change your way of thinking, I believe. Uh, Jacqueline is the founder and CEO of Acumen. Acumen is a nonprofit impact investing fund that we're going to be talking about more in much greater detail today. It changes the way the world tackles poverty by investing in companies. In other words, there is not a bright line between philanthropy and free enterprise. On the contrary, it is a, an amalgam of the two approaches that truly is novel. Um, under Jacqueline's leadership, Acumen has invested more than $88 million in 82 companies. Is that correct? Is that, cu is that current? Um, in, hmm? Yes. We okay. had it, it might be over 90 after yesterday. Okay. But. All right. That's pretty good. Um, and, and these are companies in South Asia and Africa, um, basically all over the world, where there is a need for this approach. Delivering health care, water, housing, education, and energy, all of it oriented toward the poor. These companies have created and supported 60,000 jobs and brought basic services to more than 123 million people. Her background before joining Acumen is, uh, is a marvel. She founded and directed the Rockefeller Foundation's Philanthropy Workshop and the Next Generation Leadership Program. She co-founded a microfinance institution in Rwanda, where you lived for three years, I believe, and she began her career at Chase Manhattan Bank. She's on the board of uh, a number of great organizations, such as the Aspen Institute, and if that were not all, she is also the author of the 2010 bestseller, The Blue Sweater, Bridging the Gap Between Rich and Poor in an Interconnected World. If you haven't read it, um, you should. Um, there are a lot of key insights that have attracted me to Jacqueline's work. I've known about her for a long time, and I'm delighted to say that we've become friends over the past few months. We had a terrific dinner the other night at Jacqueline's apartment in New York City where we talked about some of the biggest issues that are facing us in politics and in politics in, in America and around the world and how all of us can be better ready to serve the poor. Been looking forward to this one for a long time. Welcome, Thanks. Jacqueline. Thanks, Arthur. Right. I'm excited too. to have this conversation at AEI that's going to benefit everybody, I think. Um, I want to start with a little bit of background. Um, some people know really well what Acumen does. Those who don't are going to be amazed. So can you just walk us through one of your recent projects, from investors to entrepreneurs to customers, to just kind of give us the full flavor of this, this phenomenon, because that's really what it is. This is not an investment vehicle. It's a phenomenon, sort of soup to nuts, helping people. How does it work? All right, great. So um, I'll start with the investors who are, at the very early stage of change, philanthropists. So people give us philanthropy. Um, to find those entrepreneurs that are daring to tackle the biggest problems that they see um, where both markets have failed in aid and government have fallen short. I'm going to give you the example which is uh, doesn't immediately come to mind for most people but it's emergency services, ambulances. So in India um, you've got a big bloated corrupt government ambulance system and you've got a very small private sector ambulance system, both of which are broken, also corrupt. Um, until a few years ago, if you wanted to go to the hospital, you called a taxi. If you wanted to go to the morgue, you called an ambulance. You had to pay a bribe to get it. So uh, first thing that happens, entrepreneur comes in and says, I've got this crazy idea. I've got eight ambulances. I'm going to bust this system. I'm going to build you a much better system. Um, with a pricing model that's all private. So if I take you to the uh, pay hospital, you pay. If I take you to a public clinic, it's free, or whatever you can afford. Uh, so that my ethos can be serviced for all, but it's done through the private sector. Uh, 
no traditional investor is going to put money into a company like that, particularly in a city like Mumbai with 17 million people, mm -hmm. eight ambulances. So we take our philanthropy, but rather than give it away, we buy 30% of this company. Uh, we use patient capital because it's got to be long term uh, so that the entrepreneurs can risk, fail, learn, start again. Uh, I don't think we understood just how much they would have to fight vested interests, big bureaucracy. Everything from trying to get a number without paying bribes to sabotage of their company to teaching people that there's actually a legitimate system. So you have to build a market. Um, what happens then are exogenous factors. As this company is growing and we are continuing to invest not only capital, but then we use more philanthropy to bring in leadership, talent to our fellows program. <coughs> seven fellows over seven years. Um, there's a terrorist attack in Mumbai and suddenly not only does Acumen see that this thing works, but the population and government sees that a city needs an emergency response system that the world can count on. Interestingly, the same thing happened in the United States in the Cold War, where Eisenhower saw that we only had a private sector ambulance company. And so if we got attacked by a nuke, we didn't have an emergency response system. That was when government came in and started partnering with the private sector to build out a public system. Same thing happened in India. So this company went from a private company into partnership with government mm -hmm. and we could put more traditional capital then at that point into the company and now um, that little eight ambulance company has a thousand ambulances, five thousand employees, serves two hundred million people across India and last Monday opened um, its first uh, fleet of ambulances in Dubai. There's also a copycat of it in Pakistan and they're in conversations with Saudi Arabia. Wow. So you can really make public change starting with private resources and private um, innovation. Hmm. How long was this period from eight ambulances up to, what did you say, a thousand? Uh, almost eight years. So this is a really high rate of change. I mean, it was doubling every year for a long time. Oh, yeah. And then some. But when you look at traditional capital and traditional funds, people want the money in and out in between anywhere from three to seven years, and they want high returns. Right. And so how much, the, you, you put in 30%, you bought a 30% share in the eight ambulance company. How much money was that? Well, I can't tell you because we haven't sold the company yet. Uh, but, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, okay, so, so let's get, we'll be talking to the Department of Justice. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it was uh, clearly not a huge amount of money, but your investors are going to get a big return. Well, remember, any, our investors in the first phase of this company were all philanthropists. And so Acumen will get a return, and that will be used to reinvest in other innovations for the poor. The other thing to remember uh -huh. is that while this might be a, a success story with a 5x return to our capital, there are a lot of failures that happen as well. And side by side, we needed a lot of philanthropy to put talent into the company so that this company could succeed. From our perspective, success is that we built a company that really created a private and public system for change. You created jobs. The world changed. We, we busted a category, if you will. And then the, the mega home run will be when the capital comes back to mm -hmm. us so we can reinvest it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, paint a picture for me of the people that are putting in the capital. They're, they're the donors to Acumen so that Acumen can, can make these investments. Not, obviously not the actual people, but who's the kind of person who is, who's investing in Acumen? We have about 400 people around the world um, from 22 countries, so including the countries in which we operate. Local <coughs> Pakistanis, Kenyans, Ghanaians, um, Indians, Colombians that are supporting Acumen so that we can do this work. Um, I would say anything from a young person in banking um, that gives us five to $10,000 a year up to names that you would recognize that mm -hmm. would support Acumen with a million dollars in a year. And the reason they do is they see not only great efficiency in the way that they're using philanthropy for change, but long-term sustainability. That if you get these right, you don't shut it down when the philanthropist gets bored because you've got a company that's actually working and it's working over the long term. 
Um, foundations are also working with us, and interesting, interestingly, corporations are now coming to us. Because as these companies really build and mm. scale, they've got all the same issues that major, major companies have, supply chain issues, marketing issues. So we have um, partnerships with Dow and Unilever and Barclays who mm. are bringing some of their talent to help build out these companies. Mm. Have you spawned similar startups? like Acumen? Are there other, other organizations like Acumen that have started because of your success? Since we started, there have been about 300 um, impact investment funds that have started. And so now there's this whole sector called impact investing. And then we also worked on metrics with other organizations to help create almost a trade association called the Aspen Network uh, of Development Enterprises, Andy. Um, IRIS, which is looking at standards for how you measure impact, not just Mm -hmm. financial change. So I think that we're starting to see a great convergence, Arthur, um, where everybody is starting to recognize that we need to do things differently, um, private sector, government, and philanthropy, if we're really going to create a system that includes everybody. Mm. You talk about patient capital, and, and I think we have a concept of what that means. You're not trying to get the return out in a month. Um, or people shouldn't expect to get the return out in a month because sometimes it takes a long time to do the kinds of things like you were talking about the ambulance project in India. Um, but you've also talked about in what you've written about patient capital being a third way to think about aid. That suggests that there are two other ways. What are the two? For, what are the first two ways that are that are less adequate to doing it? Um, well, in some ways, it's connected to my own background. I started off, as you said, on on Wall Street, primarily in Latin America, and I saw the power of markets. I also saw its limitations in terms of markets um, sometimes overlook or exploit the poor. And on the other side, I saw, when I moved to Rwanda, I saw the power of really smart philanthropy and aid, and I also saw the, the, the tendency of top-down approaches to traditional aid and charity to create dependence. And if I have learned anything in this career of mine, it is that uh, dignity is more important to the spirit than wealth, and that if we're serious about poverty, we've got to find those initiatives that enable people to have freedom and have choice and really participate. So what patient capital does as a third way is to take the best of markets and the, the humanitarian ethos of philanthropy to, to determine its success based on those enterprises that can sustain themselves, therefore move to profitability, by bringing affordable services to the poor, which will require often a mix of hardcore investment and philanthropy side by side long enough until you've created some sort of system where the poor can really participate. Hmm. Uh, you've, you've given me a couple of criteria for investment. One was about the poor, and the other is that it can be sustainable. So those are obviously two of your investment criteria. But I'm wondering, how did you know about this ambulance company? How do you find the companies to invest in? How do you know what you're going to invest in next? Well, when we first started, um, we didn't. And we, were, we just were scrambling, trying to even create the idea that this was possible. Now, as I said, there's a field that has developed. So we actually look at 100 companies for every company we would invest in. So we're not any different in terms of the numbers from a, a typical venture capital firm. Um, I would say, like you said, the four screens would be, one, is this truly serving the poor? People who are making one, two, three dollars a day. Uh, two, is it an idea that matters, that we actually see will change their lives? Three, and most, or one and two are the t together. Two is, most important is, who is this entrepreneur? Not only does this entrepreneur have the self-awareness and the capacity to build the kind of company that will serve millions, but do they have the ethical fiber that will do it in a way that is not corrupt? Do they have the determination and the grit to fight what we know is going to come down the pike at them? And then the, the last two are really around the business model. Do we see a business model that we believe will move to profitability? And uh, we're not we're not going to spend 10 years if your end game is 10,000 people. Will it actually reach a million people or more? Hmm. So criteria two, three, and four are effectively exactly the same criteria you'd have if you were a, a traditional for-profit commercial venture capital firm. You know, is the entrepreneur any good? Is the business model any good? And is this going to be sustainable for creating explosive returns? True. 
we just need entrepreneurs to have a little bit more grit and determination because, and they really have to understand how the poor make decisions. So mm -hmm. I can't tell you how many um, amazing engineers come in with the water technology that's going to change the world. But they have never spent any time in a village. They don't understand how people make decisions. And I could put money on it that probably isn't going to work. I don't care how good your technology is. So give me an example of a, 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 a terrific idea that would be utterly unworkable. <laughs> I just want to make sure I don't do this at some point. <laughs> well, I mean, probably our, our first big failure, uh, which was unfortunately our second investment, or maybe fortunately because people gave us a pass, was a um, electromagnetic immunosensor, um, which was a way. What is that? Uh, well, that, that was what my big lesson was. If you don't really understand it, you have no business I mean, it sounds investing. awesome. So, <laughs> like, I want to invest in that. I like is, saying you know? it. I really liked saying it when we first uh, did it. Um, it, was, it was a really low-cost way to test whether someone had disease, essentially, um, where you wouldn't have the mess of blood, which is, is quite problematic mm. in the developing world. Um, but taking a technology like that to market costs tens of millions of dollars. And again, not only changing individuals' behavior, but changing market structures was an impossibility for us. Um, on the water filtration side, which I think is one of the hardest areas, is that we'll get um, very cool technologies that uh, you can you know, wear a backpack and take it house to house to deliver water to the poor. And um, people actually care about how their water tastes a lot. People care about whether they trust you. and what this water is. I think people underestimate that, um, and this sounds trite, but they underestimate just how human we all are, hmm. and that the poor are as human as the rich. They care about beauty, comfort, status, and we're often willing to pay a higher price to get it. And we sometimes bring in our own cultural arrogance by thinking we're doing good for others, uh, and actually are being insulting and uh, misguided. Interesting. You know, a lot of venture capitalists will say that the biggest problem they have with brilliant entrepreneurs with great ideas is they they overinvest in technology and they underinvest in relationships. I mean, it is basically the human side of all entrepreneurship is underemphasized among many entrepreneurs that are not really that comfortable with the humans, which is and so venture venture capitalists are always looking for those who say, oh, I actually understand how this integrates into the human experience. And you've just told us that. Okay, so let's get back to the electromagnetic. Uh, magnetic no, let's immunity. not. Let's not. No, no, and the reason <laughs> I want to ask about this one more time is tell me what went wrong with that one. So walk me through that failure a little bit more. Well, so in that case, I mean, this, is, this goes back 13 years now. Mm -hmm. But in that case, um, our, our capital didn't have to be patient because it just, it just burned. <laughs> um, it impatiently all went away. <laughs> impatiently <laughs> evaporated. Um, and so in that case, it was, it actually made us move away from technology, to your point. That what we, the insight that we got from it was that we were, our capital was going to, and our brains were going to go much further by looking at health delivery systems, like ambulances. Um, we have a maternal health care franchise um, system in, in India, not the actual technology. And so now we're starting to look at technologies in a different way with a lot more sophistication. But back then, it was the dot-com boom. It was all the rage to look at these technologies that would change the world. And uh, now with mobile phones, you start to see some real change through that mm. kind of technology. But um, show me the system. Show me how you understand distribution. Show me how you understand the poor and how they make decisions. Much more interesting conversation about change. Well, it's pretty interesting. So, so uh, the main thing you learned from that was exactly what my friends in in venture capitalism will tell tell you, which is don't underemphasize the role of human interaction in what an entrepreneur's idea is really going to be all about, and don't be oh, don't be so uh, enamored with the tech. And in fact, at Acumen, we train our leaders, and including our team, um, in three, three real disciplines. Financial investing, obviously, operations, 
And then the third, which people see as a soft skill, but I would say is often one of the hardest skills, is moral imagination. So moral the, imagination. The ability to put yourself in another's shoes and build solutions from their perspective. So it's empathy. Yeah, and, and even more than, and, than empathy, it's, 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 yeah, it's empathy in a very pragmatic way. And probably the best story that I have that comes to mind is with a company called D-Light. It's a, it's a solar light company. We've been with this company, like the ambulance company, since startup. Um, we invested at the prototype level. It was a, a light um, that was too big. Um, but at that point, we thought, build it and they will come. We've now learned that build it and they will come is a big fat lie when it comes to uh, the poor. That, um, it had to be iterated on many, many times. It's a long story, but today uh, that company sells about 500,000 units a month, mostly in Africa, and um, has brought affordable solar light to 40 million people. I happen to be um, visiting one of those individuals with this big Australian um, distributor for Africa, and um, the woman we were visiting named Teresia is this tiny woman, grandmother, and I said to her, why don't you tell David what you like and don't like about this light? And in the old charity model, people would always say nice things to you because you've just given them a gift. In this model, she's a customer. Um, but I did not expect her to be quite as forthcoming as she was. And she puts her hands on her hips like this and she said, well, you know, first, if I could charge my cell phone at the same time I was charging my light, this, this would be a much better product. And I thought, well, that is a great insight. And then she went, and second, and then went on to give him four recommendations as to how he would improve his life. And um, as I was watching this little woman talk to this big man, I thought, this is, this is the power, this is why I started Acumen, and this is the power of patient capital, because she is not, neither pandering nor is she begging, but she's talking to him as an equal, as a customer, and he is trying to earn her trust, and it is in that interaction that they have the opportunity to transform each other. And for me, that's, that's the dignity that comes from real moral imagination. Not, I'm here to save you, I'm here to help you, but I'm here to build something with you because you have something to bring and I have something to bring, and, and that's the way the world can actually change. Mm. The relationship between uh, two people is re remarkably different when one is a customer as opposed to one being a grant recipient or the recipient of charity. And that's, a, is that, that, that's what you're trying to establish, right? It yeah, and more than a customer in, in terms of I'm going to extract whatever I can from you. It's really, an, in, in some ways, the more I think about patient capital, it, I start to think of it as a philosophy that really is based on a more human approach to the kind of capitalism we need to, to build for the world. And I think there's a craving for it, uh -huh. um, certainly in this next generation. Yeah, for sure. And you know, let, let, me, let me drill into that just a, a little bit more before we go back to patient capital. Um, you and I, um, one of the things, the, the worries I think that you and I share, because we've talked about this a, a bunch of times now, um, you, know, you look around today and you look at the political dialogue, and, and of which actually there's remarkably little political dialogue. And there's mostly recrimination and reproach and, and a kind of an icy silence, uh, at least talking to each other. Um, if you could characterize it as, uh, as a real shame that when you think about the free enterprise discussion, which you're really comfortable with, people think of that as something kind of on the political right. And when you talk about the poverty discussion, that's something on the political left. That's wrong, right? And what do we do? And how can Acumen and AEI and other organizations that reject those characterizations, what can we do to actually build better dialogue? Because it's not about a political win, it's actually about helping people using both tools. Do you have any thoughts on that that you can share with? I, I, first of all, it's one of the reasons I so deeply appreciate you as a thought leader um, and what you represent. And we need more of you. So. Mm -hmm. Thank you for being you. Thank you. And I want to make sure everybody got that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and that we're not afraid to talk about where we disagree, but let's start with the 85% of agreement. Um, second, I think we actually need to listen to more voices of the poor themselves. Hmm. Uh, some of the most extraordinary, and frankly, when I wrote my book, surprising conversations which were incredibly intimidating when I first started them, were in slum communities. 
So imagine writing a book about people who are in the slums and you're standing there in front of them to be like, so what do you think? Um, and what they think is that we want markets to work for us because we work in a really, we live in a really cruel market system because they're unfair, they're fully corrupt. We don't get health care unless we pay up front. And so we die. Um, that's a, it's a powerful conversation. And if our policymakers could listen, starting with the people who are most impacted by the policies that were created, well, maybe we would start to have a little bit more empathy and we would build smarter, conversa smarter conversations that translated into smarter policies. And so maybe I should bring a whole group to uh, Nairobi and all these places yeah. for people to see um, and starting in this own, our own country. Yeah, do you think that uh, this insight um, about the, the complete harmoniousness between <coughs> poverty relief and free enterprise properly understood because brutal capitalism that actually doesn't help people and doesn't recognize market failure is not free enterprise. I mean, that's, that's one of the key distinctions between pure capitalism and free enterprise to be sure. What can we, is, is this the same problem that we have with the poor in the United States? I mean, is, this is not, I'm, I'm gonna assume that this is not simply relegated to South Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa. I mean, do you see this around the United States as well, that, that the poor don't have enough access to uh, everything from the safety net to truly fair free enterprise? Uh, what are your thoughts on that? It's absolutely the same in the United States. Where it, where it's, it's, where it's, where it does differ is, that we've got so many public programs that are also dysfunctional, but could be made more functional, functional using companies to push. And an example I would give would be, um, when you look at our healthcare system, the United States spends by far and away more money on both private healthcare and public healthcare than any other country in the world. And yet you look at how our numbers are getting worse and worse and worse, particularly for the poor, we, we, we rate like Bangladesh um, when you look at African-American males in this country compared to $2 a day Bangladeshi males um, on, on a health basis. Really, on, on health outcomes, on longevity? Life expectancy, health outcomes, um, maternal, a lot of our mater maternal mortality rates now in, in states like Mississippi and Alabama look Plenty bad when mm -hmm. it comes to, in fact, Kerala's are better, in India, are better than the United States in some of our um, poorest southern states. So how do we change that? Not by yelling at each other, mm -hmm. but I think that there are real opportunities for the young social entrepreneurs, not to say government is bad or good, but are there ways to create more efficient and effective ways to get people access that saves money, builds health, and measures that so as a country we celebrate mm. those change rather than just yelling at each other across ideological um, rifts. Mm. Um, I want you to look into your crystal ball a little bit because you've been thinking a lot about how we can fix problems of poverty in new and, and innovative and entrepreneurial ways. Um, somebody else who does that is the last guest that we had on our philanthropic freedom uh, interview series, and that was Bill Gates. Um, <laughs> the Bill Gates, not just a Bill Gates. And, uh, <clears throat> and Bill Gates actually made a pretty stunning prediction when he was here at AEI. He, he said that true poverty, as traditionally understood, now we can define any poverty in the way we want. We could say poverty is anything under $35 a day if we want, but basically it's $1 or $2 a day as we, you and I look at it. Um, he says poverty is traditionally understood uh, can be and very likely will be effectively eradicated by the year 2035. What say you? Um, I think if, if your definition of true poverty is a technical de definition of people making less than $1.25 a day, um, or even more countries that are falling within the um, poor versus unpoor category, I think that that's a real possibility. Um, I think if your definition of true poverty, which is our definition at Acumen, um, which is much more connected to human dignity, as a human being, do I have choice? Do I have freedom? Do I, am I safe to 
enough to send my children to school and to get them health care so that I can be a real participant. You're going up Maslow's pyramid a little bit higher. A little bit higher. So I'm a participant. We have a long way to go. And I think that our world would be so much more the world we all want if we looked at poverty both in material and spiritual terms. Um, that we we all want the same things. That sounds so trite, but we've got a long way to go. So by definition, in the United States, we don't have poverty in, a, in that technical poverty sense. But a quarter of our kids go to bed hungry every night. So that's where the work needs to be done is, mm -hmm. is defining poverty mm. based on a lack of capability, a lack of freedom, a lack of choice. Mm. Interesting. I mean, this is a more holistic understanding of need suggests that, of course, we're going to still have need in 2035. Of course, there will still be challenges. There will be opportunities for us to, to work as uh, people who care about those who have less and those who are vulnerable. 25% of people in the United States go to bed hungry each night. 25% of public school children don't receive an adequate education that's, that matches any sort of of, uh, of cr any career that's productive in the American economy. I mean, these, these are, it's hard to so imagine. So how can right. this all work? Right. Unless we make sure that we have people who are ready and able to participate and desiring to participate. So the, the definition of need, of course, is, is just a, <laughs> it's complicated, but it's great that you're talking about this. Tell me a little bit more. What would it mean, what does it mean for people to have human dignity? Um, it means that when I um, wake up in the morning, I actually have the opportunity to work. Um, in many of the places in which we work, um, uh, people have been resettled two hours out of a slum in Delhi uh, so that t to move, you know, a government housing or what have you and they have to take a bus for $2 a day into town for two hours to hope that somebody will hire them as a day laborer, and that often doesn't happen, and so then they end up often not going. That's not dignity. It means if your child is sick that you don't have to prostitute yourself or go to a money lender at usurious rates that will potentially keep your family in poverty, but you actually have a way to keep that child alive and healthy. It means that your children can go to the school you want and not necessarily to a madrasa that is at least a way to get that kid some food. It means really being able to get the basics taken care of so that you can really start to dream about participating. Hmm. And when you think about three billion people on the planet making less than $3 a day, really being effectively cut out of society, we are missing the opportunity of all those people to be our musicians and our Einsteins and our professors. It's really all of us that lose. Hmm. You know, this is, uh, I want to I want to emphasize this a little bit because I think this is a, this is a really pivotal moment um, in our understanding of poverty, if we can make this thing in. What Jacqueline is saying right now is that poor people are not liabilities. Poor people are assets. They're assets that are under tapped. They're sort of dead capital that we, can, we have to enliven. And this is part of your definition of human dignity. And to the extent that a society, whether it's in India or the United States, treats poor people like liabilities, it's not going to treat their human dignity. It's just going to worry about their stuff. And to the extent that we treat them as assets to society, we're going to liven their capital, and that will also give them earned success and dignity. Is this your approach? Do you think you could join my team and become my <laughs> communications director? <laughs> <laughs> but, that was so good. <laughs> this, is, uh, this is revolutionary. Well, so let me give you an example also about when you said, what's the third way? Um, I'm sorry you're eating lunch. So I, if you are, just stop. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but you've got three million people living in the slums of Nairobi. In the worst slums, Mathari, Kibera, Kibera You've got almost 2 million people. There are no toilets that work. Um, these are place, places that are known um, for flying toilets. So because the government has, you're, you're a slum, you're on illegal land, even though you've been there for five generations, um, there's no infrastructure. The market says, no way 
are we ever going to go into the slums to provide toilets? And the charities say, these people need toilets, so we're going to build a latrine, but there's nothing. What do you do with the waste from that latrine? Those latrines are dirty, they're dangerous, and who would ever want to go there? So what people do is defecate on paper or in a plastic bag in their home, and they throw it, the flying toilet. When you walk through, it's right out there for everybody to play in, see, uh, get sick from. Um, so these three young entrepreneurs, and this is where the millennials are so amazing, that third way is to look at that problem from a market perspective, from a charity perspective. Forget what perspective, from a solutions perspective, based on dignity. And they say, all right, first we've got a design issue, and can we create a, a toilet that people really want to go to? And so it, they brand it Fresh Life. There's a vanity station. Um, and then there's a technical piece where the, the waste is separated. Um, it's picked up every day, so it never smells. It's a really pleasant experience. You clean it after every uh, use. You pay five shillings if you're an adult, three if you're a kid. And um, that waste is then brought back, composted, turned into organic fertilizer. And the idea is it will be sold onto the market, uh, both to smallholders and to corporations. Mm -hmm. Now, finding, building a new market for human organic fertilizer is, is going to be a, a big... Sounds tricky. Tricky deal. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but it's starting slowly. And right now they're moving five metric tons of waste a day out of these slums. 300 um, women now, or uh, 300 toilets are now up and running. About half of them are women. And um, about 12,000 people use these every single day. If this thing works, and it might take 10 years, we now have a model for sanitation that actually provides jobs, creates better agriculture, and brings human dignity. That's the way we need to start thinking as a world. Amazing. It's not just people that are assets. OK, human don't go there. OK. All <laughs> right. OK. <laughs> Thank you for saving me there. I was really going down a bad track. I do have yeah. four brothers, Arthur, uh, yeah, and they yeah, yeah, just yeah, like yeah, you do. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I, have, I have teenage boys. You can tell where I'm getting my yeah, humor. Yeah, yeah, okay. I, I um, <laughs> before we turn it over to the audience, because they've got some questions too, I know, and, and I don't want to hog all the time. We've got about 20 minutes left. Uh, we've got a lot of young people here, and uh, who wouldn't want to be you? I mean, it's, a I mean, like right now, I want to be you. So, and and um, what wh I'd like you to give us some advice. Um, now, I mean, I read your bio, which is sort of intimidating for a lot of people because you've done a lot of things. I mean, you worked for Chase Manhattan Bank, where you had a really successful career. You've worked in the traditional nonprofit sector. You've learned a lot. I mean, you've traveled. I mean, you can't just do that. That's not something. It's not a career that you have immaculately conceived. It's something that takes a lot of time and and and. What are you going to talk? What are you going to tell the ordinary people who want to participate in this, but don't have that kind of background? How can somebody just start getting involved and in, in, in create some value along these lines? What, what's the advice that you give people? Um, well, let me answer answer that on two levels. For for acumen, actually, we've had to build a lot of tools because so many people have come to us. So the first thing that we did was build a fellows program um, for those people that really want to put their lives into this work. And we started off with a global level and take 10 people a year, but are now getting about 1,200 applications from 100 countries for that. So when we realized that demand was so great and we had even more need in the countries in which we operated, we started regional programs. And now we've got um, regional programs running in Pakistan, India, and East Africa, 20 fellows in each. But just this morning, I got the numbers in, and we got another 2,000 applications for those programs. So you start to see this thirst out there. So we said to the young people who want to be part of it, why don't you start chapters? And now there are 26 chapters around the world, including one in Washington. I don't know if there's a chapter member here, back there. Um, and it's one of our best chapters. I think there's like five or 700 people in the Washington chapter. So these are young professionals that want to think about getting involved in this work in one way or another. Um, and Acumen is just one channel for it. But to learn to know each other, to network, to start to understand how this works. Then the chapter member said to us, can't you give us some of the training that you're giving to your fellows? So we started um, online courses about a year ago 
in leadership, in social metrics, in moral imagination, um, and 100,000 people are taking those courses this year. Uh, and so that's another way, is to go online, take these courses. You have to do meetups, so you start learning, getting educated. And then I would say from that, there are real opportunities to think about um, building your own social enterprise, getting involved in other social enterprises. Obviously, financially supporting organizations like ours that do this kind of work. But I would say that even beyond that, in some ways, particularly with this generation, there's such a, it, there's almost a, um, a too, an over-reverence for the entrepreneur. Hmm. And that what we really need, if we're going to change the world, which is long and hard and messy and requires not only lateral thinking but more nuanced thinking, is um, for people wherever they are to start changing the way they, they define their own success. And so whether you're working at a corporation or on Wall Street or in the church or in a nonprofit, to be asking yourself, are my actions, is my language bringing more freedom, more dignity to other people rather than did I make more money today? Hmm. Um, that that it, when we start shifting in this way, I think that we can start creating more unconventional partnerships to make the change that the world is crying for. Hmm. So did my actions today neglect the poor or create more dignity? Did my actions today create more dependence or more dignity? These are the way that you can avoid the pitfalls of way one and two and think more along the channels of, of the third way. Is that right? That's right. Um, I'm going to turn to the audience now, but w one more quick a matter of, of housekeeping. Uh, you talked about chapters for Acumen. You talked about courses that people can do take, and you talked about the fact that investing capital in the organization is a great thing to do, and there's a need for that. On your website, you can get all the information to do any of those things. Donors can go there. Students can go there. People want to get involved with their time, talent, and treasure in any other way can go to your website and find out how to do it, right? Yes. What's the website? Acumen.org. All right, that's easy. I'm going to turn to you. Um, who's first? We've got a bunch of people who've got some, uh, got some questions out here. Let's start here right in the middle. This man. Can you say your, wait for the mic and, and then say your name? That's great. Thanks. My name is Rachel Mann. I'm a research associate at the Public International Law and Policy Group. And I was wondering if you could just elaborate a little on um, how you work with the government structures and existing civil society organizations when you begin work, and what do you do uh, when you see these structures as a barrier to access? Um, thanks. So Acumen itself doesn't start off by saying, "Here's let's work with a particular government or not. It would be more when um, one of our companies either hits a barrier or starts to partner with government for change. Interestingly, the the real innovation that I'm starting to see in the world around serving the poor is coming from corporations. And I have literally had conversations with um, three different CEOs of Fortune 100 companies that have either the technologies that we were talking about earlier that are, they would call orphan technologies, um, that are too small, too hard to actually, for them as a big entity, to roll out and serve low-income markets, and yet they, they and their employees are starting to ask themselves the question, if we can do this, don't we have a moral obligation to do it, even if it's a loss leader? And will the world then see that we're a better citizen? And I think that in that is a huge opportunity for a different kind of partnership, and it is pushing both civil society to learn more about the corporates, as well as the corporates to understand what it means to work with smaller, nimble, but resource-constrained organizations. And some of the best examples that we have would be um, with Dow and with Unilever. And the way we've learned is the way we do everything from entrepreneurially and from the bottom up. We start with technical assistance, where they bring their, their senior leaders to actually work with our companies so that we get to know each other. And Arthur used the word relationship before. It's really about building trust, building relationship, and ensuring that there's alignment. Because too often people start with partnership, but they're not honest about what they get out of the deal and the partnership, and what the others are getting out of the partnership and what you're trying to do together. And if we don't get better at having language around that, we're gonna get the same kind of dysfunction we've gotten too often in the past. 
Let's uh, go right back here, and then we'll come up to the front table. Yeah. <clears throat> 20 years. 20 years. Your yes, uh, my name is Mark Carr, and um, I'm the board chair of the DC Plus Acumen chapter. Thank um, you so, so much. No, yeah. thank you. <laughs> Uh, my question, and one of the questions we get um, a lot as a as a chapter, is um, what or have there been any successful exits? And if so, besides the financial returns, uh, what are some other um, characteristics of a good exit? Thanks for that. Um, we've exited of, of the 88 million. Um, we've we've brought back about 14 million to Acumen, so that's 14 million that we didn't have to fundraise, which is the fundraiser, a big deal, um, that then will be reinvested. The, the big exits that everyone's waiting for is a, is a, tricky, a tricky question in that um, we, we think internally about do you exit for the sake of exiting when you're trying to raise money as a company is really growing, or do you actually stay with the company and continue to claim and build value so that when you finally exit, both there's more financial resources coming back to Acumen, but that the, you've got something really to show the world. So there are three companies that we are looking at as potential exit, but I think that um, the short term, short term, five to seven year exit is very much overrated, and and wait for this to play out ten years from beginning to end of this capital, and you're going to see some real exits. So I wouldn't feel defensive about that answer. Um, and the second one is, in addition to exit, when I look at success, I really do start to think about those category-breaking um, innovations that wouldn't have happened without this kind of investment. So a D-Lite, seven years ago, solar at a unit level was, first of all, too expensive for a household to use. Um, now that you're at 40 million, you've proven a model with a profitable company that is continuing to grow. We're also seeing um, a platform on which you can build other lessons and other kinds of products. So that company has spawned other companies like a company called Mcopa, which is now a joint venture between d -Light, the solar company, and M-Pesa, which is a mobile um, banking platform in Kenya. Based on the insight that the poor want access to solar, and frankly, they want access to more than a light. They'd like a system. And once you make that conversion, we had to do the hard work for five years to convert people to actually trust that solar would work better than kerosene. But the real thing is you pay for kerosene a little bit every day. That's how they wanted to pay. So the economists who say, well, if you're paying $4 a month for your solar and $5 a month for kerosene, of course you want solar. But if you're paying 50 cents a day for your kerosene, that's all that matters. Now with mobile banking, you can pay 50 cents a day for your solar. So when you start to look at why we stay in, this kind of learning is actually a public good. And that's one of the reasons Acumen continues to, to serve as a nonprofit, because we're essentially um, an action think tank combined to this pragmatic investor um, and leadership builder organization. Hmm. You know, you said that you, know, we, I mean, you gave an example of being really patient and <laughs> patient capital, saying the success at exit might be 10 years from now. How long is your strategic plan for Acumen? Is it 30 years out into the future? Do you have an idea of what the company is going to look like uh, in decades from now, given how patient your capital is? We do have an idea, and, and, it, and it's interesting because, again, it goes back to relationship and trust. When we went into Pakistan in right after 9 11, so 2001, um, I was very clear with the board and with myself that we were there for 30 years, um, that there were going to be really hard times, and as we all know, there have been really hard times. But if you are really focused on building models that are economically sound, that serve the very poor, leaders that long term will be, I believe, really shifting both the business community and government in Pakistan, you're looking at a, at a 20 to 30 year time horizon. And so when I look 20 to 30 years in the future, I see not only many funds, but a whole ecosystem of companies, leaders, ideas that are interacting for real change. And one quick example that took 
10 years, um, is in Pakistan. And you could all check this out because it's very cool um, on the website. But, uh, or actually not on the website, which is even cooler, because um, there's an ecosystem that's building in Pakistan um, where you've got some of our fellows that left Google and Apple to go back, either as Americans or Pakistanis, and live in Lahore. And they're working on, one is building an alternative to YouTube, because the country shut down YouTube. Another is building, a, a, an African American is building a vocational company to train low income workers. Then there's this regional fellow, Waqas Ali, who didn't go to college, but he's, and you have nice shoes, so I might have to get you a pair. Um, <laughs> he's making beautiful handcrafted shoes with cobblers outside of Lahore. He wants to be the Zappos of Pakistan. Mm. But frankly, his design needed a little work, his website needed a lot of work, and he needed a marketing strategy. Well, now you've got an ecosystem of other young entrepreneurs who are willing to help Wakas. And they recently, last week, did a Kickstarter campaign. I didn't even know it was happening. A Kickstarter campaign from Pakistan for Wakas. And um, the goal was $15,000, which is a lot for these workers. And so far, I, I checked this morning, um, they've raised about $47,000 from people around the world. And not only are you now creating a hero in the midst of what we see in the news with ISIS and everything else, a hero inside and outside the country, but you're enabling a community to support the right values, work, to provide work for other people from a place that rewards what's good in us. And that's what I think. Um, when I look out, I don't really care if Acumen's a billion dollar fund. or I care about an ecosystem of millions of people that are using, seeing investment as one tool, seeing leadership as the, as the, the most important thing that we need to develop in ourselves, to use investment, to use charity, to build strong government, to get rid of corruption to build a, a, a world that sees the poor as full human beings mm. and move from there. Terrific. You know, uh, one, one quick point to emphasize again, and I think it's important for us to, r to recognize, is that, you know, Jacqueline talked about a 30-year time horizon in particular projects, at least a 30-year time horizon in, as a matter of strategic planning for acumen, and she has a something like at least a 30-year conveyor belt for talent. We just met somebody. This is a big deal for succession. This suggests that there is this notion that 50 years from now, Acumen's going to be here. And 30 and 40 years from now, we actually might even see the face of somebody who's stewarding some of these projects. It's amazing. Oh, yeah. Well done. Well done. Who's next? Uh, we, we're going to come right here next. Uh, my name is Vanessa Berry, and I'm a senior advisor on youth entrepreneurship at the US Department of State. I and mean, I just have a question about the role of uh, innovation education in these low-income communities um, to essentially empower these individuals uh, to become innovators and problem solvers. Have you seen effective models um, specifically for offline communities that may not have access to the amazing PLOS Acumen courses that are, that are online um, to teach them these innovation skills? Uh, what, what do you mean by off? Offline, so just not online oh, oh, that oh, don't have access to the internet. Sure, and in fact, what, what's exciting me though is that these online tools are now being used by offline communities, and 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 you know the Jesuits talk about um, this idea of accompaniment, and I think it's a really underrated, um, not only ethos but uh, something that we need to think about in the way that we build our companies. So, I have a quick example even. Um, of young men who read my book and decided they wanted to create book clubs um, across Kenya. Um, and that led to them deciding they wanted to create TEDx's, the TED conference that spawns these local conferences. And they've now um, run 60 TEDx's across slums in um, East Africa. Now the Gates Foundation is supporting these young men. When I first met them, one guy, Chris Macau, was making about $30 a month selling eggs on the streets. Their average uh, education was third grade. And what they need is, is cheerleaders. What they need is a gathering space. And what they need is someone to is an institution to recognize that there has to be some safety in this well, as well. Because um, too often we have the workshop, and then you go back to kind of the 
a, a d desolate place where if you hold your head too high, someone's going to push it down. And so how do we build posses for people so that they not only are innovating, but they, they're, they've got a, a group around them who will help carry them through? And I think that it's way too underrated as we look for quick results and, um, and technical, uh, technical boxes to check. Mm -hmm. We have time for one more. Uh, I'm sorry that we're not going to get to absolutely everybody, but you've been very patient right here in the back, and you'll be our last question today. Wait for the wait, Mike's coming to you right now. Thanks. Fred Mihez with the World Bank. Thank you very much. From an investor perspective, um, we were talking about these young people, and say um, I'm starting to think about um, my retirement nest, right? And uh, I sh fully share the philosophy, your investment philosophy, and your goals. Would you recommend for a young person to put all your money in Acumen? You know, assuming it's okay, it's, it's patient capital, right? It's for retirement. Fifty percent in Acumen and fifty percent in more traditional um, investment vehicles, uh, index fund, others. That would be my first question. And number two. Um, how do you, if you look at the problem, I was recently in India and also visited the slums, and when you look at the problem like education, when do you think, when do you frame the problem as, an, as, a, as a private sector um, uh, concern or as a, as a name more sort of NGO charity? Say I, I see these girls who are not able to, super, family are not able to support, it's a cost issue, right? It's paying for the books, paying for the uniforms, etc. My first instinct or someone first instinct would be, okay, well, we're going to do adopt the child model, for example, right? So just you're channeling the resources from, from the West or from the wealthy donors to this person. But so the broader question here is, like, when do you frame an issue as a private sector solution? And when do you frame, when you see those problems, and when do you frame that as a sort of public sector charity one? The first question is, should we give you all our money? <laughs> 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 the answer is yes. Okay, well, oh my God, that was an easy one. So how about the second question, a little harder? The second question is, um, I actually no longer do say, this is a government question, this is a private sector question. If you look at Pakistan or India, 40% of the government schools are what you would call ghost schools. Nobody shows up. And the private sector is not reaching people who make a dollar a day in effective ways. There may be schools for them, and you see how desperate people are that they send their children there even though there's a, a literate person teaching them. And so the question for me is, can we use the market as a listening device, as a way to understand how we can be more efficient and effective? But can we not lose the rest of our brains and hearts as we recognize that, as Arthur said, we need every child to be educated so they can participate and be and, and see the infinite potential that, that exists in them. And so how do we use our resources, both public and private, to ensure that each child gets that education? And if we are driven by that as our end, not I've created a private sector solution, nor it's the government responsibility baby, then I actually think we're going to have a, a much healthier debate about those models that actually work. But if we continue to start at ideology, we're going to get where we're going. And so that's how I would look at it. Jacqueline Novogratz is a subversive, as you can see. I mean, she's subverting dominant paradigms, as we like to say in social science, about uh, a, a radical, uh, using a radical approach that mixes things that work for the people who need it the most. Please join me in showing our gratitude to the incomparable Jacqueline Novogratz. Thank you.